I, um, a while back, had gotten into a discussion right here on this stream, as a matter of fact. I want to say it was a while ago. It was over a year or so ago. Um, and we had talked about, briefly, about Star Wars and its relationship to Buddhism. And, you know, I'm going over, I'm, I'm watching The Mandalorian, all right? And I've also decided to try and see if I can watch everything I can Star Wars off of Disney Plus in proper chronological order. So, you know, starting with, um, starting with, you know, episode one, The Phantom Menace, going through like the first two movies and then what comes after that and then the third movie and then like I'm in the middle of the Clone Wars and that's a long series, like a long series. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how much Clone Wars <laughs> there was. <laughs> but um, I guess there's a lot to be told in Anakin's story. So, and, um, you know, I thought to myself, because I'm looking, I'm watching this and I can see some of the Buddhist philosophy and ideas in in this media, in Star Wars. So I started to do a little digging and did a little research, and um, I wanted to actually uh, talk about that. I did this discussion <coughs> with my local saga here, and while none of them are as big a nerds as I am, they seem to enjoy it. <laughs> they seem to enjoy the parallels and all that fun stuff. Um, my local Sangha. So that word Sangha is a word in Pali. And during the Buddha's day, it was what he called his group of monks that would follow him. The more modern definition is a community of people with whom you practice with regularly. Sort of think of it as like a congregation in a church or, you know, I mean, it's akin to that. So that's what it means. I'll even, here's the word spelled out. So, so that's how it's pronounced, Sangha. So I was discussing that with them. They seem to like, they seem to enjoy it. I wanted to share it with you guys too, <clears throat> because who doesn't like to talk about Star Wars? Now, I should probably... I should probably place this little warning, okay? We are going to be talking about certain aspects of Star Wars, primarily in the movies. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I picked up from my sources is mainly from the original trilogy, episodes 4, 5, and 6, all right, as well as The Last Jedi. So if you haven't seen any of these movies yet, the, you're probably going to hear some spoilers. So... If that's not something you want to hear, you know, feel free to mute if you want. But, yeah. Um, and then after this, after we get done with the talk, we could, we'll could we discuss it further as we go into the Battle in Wonderland demo. And I also got something else exciting that I got to show you before we start playing that game. It's going to be exciting. So, anyway. <laughs> so, naturally, for this discussion... I wanted to start with the series creator, obviously, George Lucas. I was kind of curious. I said, okay, well, so was George Lucas a Buddhist? Was he, you know, or did he just draw inspiration from the philosophy? You know, what was his, what was his relationship with that? And while I'm aware, and this is probably part of the inspiration for the Buddhist themes, particularly with the Jedi and in some ways the Sith also. Um, <coughs> George Lucas, um, probably common knowledge by now, did have a lot of inspiration pulled from old samurai movies. I mean, the most recent blaring example of this would have been in The Mandalorian, um, specifically the episode where they feature Ahsoka Tano played brilliantly by Rosario Dawson. Um, anyway, 
Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there is a scene that is just almost straight out of an old samurai pick, you know, flick. It's really cool. But as I did a little digging, I found one source that was able to um, well, that was able to point out that um, George Lucas actually grew up grew up a Methodist, or he grew up in Methodism. But uh, you know, he was referring to himself uh, as spiritual. Uh, at the time that the source was taken down. Um, specifically, uh, they said that he once identified as a Methodist Buddhist, which is very interesting, I thought. And he was quoted as saying, I was raised Methodist. Now, let's say I'm spiritual. It's Marin County. We're all Buddhist up here. <laughs> so, um, so while I don't know for sure, I do have the feeling that Buddhism you know, in some of his own practice and what he was taught, you know, it, it sort of kind of gives a little bit of bi uh, well, bias, not really bias, but uh, some confirmation that um, Lucas really, you know, knew what he was doing, putting um, Buddhism in mixture with uh, Star Wars. Um, one of the, one of my sources gave six similarities between Buddhist, Zen Buddhism and Star Wars, um, Zen Buddhist as opposed to like Methodist Christian. Well, I mean, Methodism is a, is a sect of Christ, it's a school of Christianity, right? I'm thinking, I mean, I don't know 100% for sure what he meant. I'm thinking he kept the Methodist part because he was raised Methodist and, probably still have some beliefs about, you know, God and about the Bible and things like that while practicing Buddhist philosophy. I mean, that could be it. Um, I don't think... I mean, personally, I'm not sure how you'd marry the two <laughs> in such a way that it would drop the Christianity part altogether. So... That's something I would have to read up more on, so that could probably be like another discussion for another day. Um, anyway, so George Lucas, aside from the Japanese films, okay, uh, one of the other, I mean, a few of the other similarities, a few of the other parallels drawn between Star Wars and specifically Zen Buddhism, um, one of them is the, the force and the similarities of the concepts of Ki or Chi. Now, honestly, in Zen Buddhism nowadays, we don't really focus so much on Ki or Chi. I mean, it's a thing, but that more or less harkens back to some of the older practices of Chan or Zen Buddhism, um, particularly in its early days when, you know, Taoism was still, you know, was a bigger part of Chinese society as a religion, you know, without, you know, without Buddhism being in a uh, part of it, uh, part of the mix. Um, and it goes on to say, it gives an example of the Empire Strikes Back where uh, Yoda says, and, you know, forgive me here, <coughs> I'm probably not going to be able to do vo Yoda's voice without aggravating my cough, so um, I might have to skip on that, otherwise I would love to, well, Maybe I can give it a try here. <clears throat> size, size matters not. Look at me. Look at me. Judge me by my size, do you? Hmm? Hmm. I don't know if I'm doing a very good impersonation or not right now. <laughs> it doesn't sound to me like I'm quite hitting the nail on the head here. And well, you should not. For my ally is the Force. And a powerful ally it is. Life creates it makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. You must feel the force around you, here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere, yes. Even between the land and the ship. <laughs> Don't push myself. Oh, I have to a little bit. The show must go on, bud. <laughs> 
Uh, let's see. <coughs> he even goes on to quote a teacher, D.T. Suzuki, as a defining key as something imperceptible, impalpable, that pervades the entire universe. In one sense, it corresponds to spirit. Yet, spirit, it is the breath of heaven and earth, which is a very interesting definition. It's also a very interesting way of describing the force. Another point made in similarity between them is intuition. So yeah, in Buddhist uh, teaching, intuition, wisdom is taught quite a bit. And in a lot of ways, in Buddhist teaching, wisdom carries more weight than knowledge. And intuition carries more weight than intellectualism itself. And it's not as to say, it's not as to say that you know, Buddhism doesn't consider knowledge and intelligence important. These are important. You do need knowledge for certain things. But, you know, also in Buddhism, there does have to be some sort of balance, the middle way, as it were. Um, but they do carry a little more weight on intuition and wisdom. Only because those tend to have more application. Um Whereas knowledge very much so does have its place. Um, I always like to say that if knowledge is power, then wisdom is knowing how to wield that power properly. And so what's more important, having that power or being able to have it in a responsible manner? Being able to use that power the way it was meant to be. You know, the way it was supposed to be, um, you know, depending on your train of thought, something to debate, but that could be a discussion for another time. Um, as far as intuition goes, um, one example came from episode four, New Hope, um, where Obi-Wan puts a blast helmet on Luke while he's training. And Obi-Wan tells Luke, I suggest you try it again, Luke. This time, go let go of your conscious self and act on instinct. And Luke replies to him, with a blast, with the blast helmet down, I can't see. How am I supposed to fight? And Obi-Wan responds, your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. Stretch out with your feelings. <clears throat> Yoda gives a, a separate lesson on intuitive mind. Uh, versus rational mind in The Empire Strikes Back, where Luke asks Yoda, uh, you know, basically how he can tell the difference between light and dark in the Force, good or bad. And Yoda taught him this. He said, You will know when you are calm, at peace, passive. A Jedi uses the Force for knowledge and defense, never for attack. And when Luke tried to follow up with, but now tell me why I can't, you got to cut some off, exclaiming, no, no, there is no why. There is no why. <clears throat> I realize that might not have come out clear. <laughs> so, and it's very interesting because in some Zen stories, the teacher would uh, strike the student to get them to stop understanding their rational mind, and what needs to be understood intuitively. You heard me right, strike. Um, very old practice, and sometimes practiced in Japan in modern day. Um, if you ever go to a Zen center, you might see that the teacher has, maybe, a, they don't really do this here in the United States, for you know obvious reasons, but... Now, there is a stick, and I forget what it's called offhand, and I'll have to look it up, but there is a stick that a teacher has that when he observes, when he or she observes their student, their students uh, meditating, or whenever they're trying to coach some of their students on something, would that I go to Japan? Yeah. Um, or they would have sort of this stick. It's like a flat stick not like their traditional 
ceremonial little short curved wand that they have, but um, a separate kind of stick that they would use to actually swiftly strike a student's shoulder. Like if they were like dozing off while meditating, which happens to me from time to time. They would strike on the shoulder in order to get the student back focused again. And they would use it for something like this. So no, American teachers or teachers here in America don't do that here because we tend to get a little more defensive when we're struck. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't think any Zen teachers want to risk, you know, getting clocked afterwards. <laughs> But they go on to say, um, Zen upholds intuition against intellectualism, for intuition is the more direct way of reaching truth. And there's going to be a little bit more on truth. In, actually, there's going to be, um, yeah, there's going to be a little bit more on truth later on. Um, because there's important distinguishment between things like truth and fact and truth and you know, experience. Um, but we, I'll get more into that here in just a little bit. Um, commitment and dedication was another um, theme drawn from the Star Wars series, uh, particularly in The Empire Strikes Back, where you know, Yoda is noted for saying one of his most popular quotes, do or do not, there is no try. And Zazen's kind of like that. Um, sitting and meditating, it's basically you either do it or you don't. Um, sure, you'll give it a try, but really, if you just let your thoughts pass, it's just, you know, getting into posture and sitting. So it's basically a do or don't kind of thing. <laughs> There's no bathroom. <laughs> so, okay, so not in that context. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of uh, promotion of focus and concentration and being in the present and commitment, which are very much hallmarks of Zen Buddhism. And like some of those concepts really actually follow one of the most basic teachings in Buddhism we call the Eightfold Noble Path. This kind of touches on right concentration and right effort. These also help with develop intuitive thinking. <clears throat> I got a note here that says, you know, the Eastern masters say that the mind needs to be still like a pond at night. Only then can you properly reflect the image of the moon. Similarly, only the mind... Oh, wait. I skipped a sentence by accident. An agitated or disturbed surface of the pond would distort the image of the moon. Similarly, <clears throat> similarly, only with the mind still and clear and not distracted or racing from thought to thought can the subconscious mind effectively communicate with the body and the conscious mind. Relativity of truth. <clears throat> so the parallels that made to the relativity of truth um, come from a conversation between Luke and Obi-Wan Kenobi. I interpret that line to mean that it's fairly based on instinct than trying. It means you're consciously attempting something that that's not how instinct works. If you're trying, then it's not instinct anymore. You know, I guess that's very true. Um, you can sort of kind of fit instinct with intuition. Instinct might be a little more baser. But, I mean, intuition is, I guess I would say the real difference between intuition and instinct is that intuition might require maybe just a little bit more thought. But it's that gut feeling. In, 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 intuition is, you know, it's where you kind of go with your gut, you know. And that's kind of what you do in instinct also, right? I mean, that's where things like fight or flight come in. And that could be what Obi-Wan was trying to teach Luke also. You know, go with your instincts, go with your gut, go with your, you know, intuition when you go to fight. You know, don't try to process everything. 
Oh, let's see. Where was I? I was relativity of truth is where I was um, starting. So they make this parallel first with the conversation between Luke and Obi-Wan Kenobi and Return of the Jedi. And the exchange goes thusly, Obi-Wan. So what I told you was true from a certain point of view. Luke has a certain point of view. And Obi-Wan states, Luke, you're going to find out that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our point of view. In point of view, that's point of view is based off opinion, right? It's based off our ego. Um, you know, it's things that we experience, things that we're taught, you know. Not everything that we experience is a factual matter. Not everything that we're taught is a factual matter. But we hold it as truth because that's what we're taught. That's what we experience, you know. That's why they say there's many different truths out there. Because of that. There's a relativity between those. Um, Um. <clears throat> But interestingly, it goes a little deeper because he quotes the Buddha in saying, nothing exists entirely alone. Everything, everything is in relation to everything else. And while I think this speaks more on the concept of dependent origination, I think what they're saying is that truth relies on that experience. Truth relies on that, you know, what is being taught. Sometimes truth does rely on fact. Sometimes truth relies on, you know, things like that. Uh, dependent origination. Quick explanation. Dependent origination is, in Buddhist philosophy, it suggests that nothing is truly independent of itself. I know that's a little hard to, that can be a little hard to wrap your head around because we always associate independence with things like, you know, being able to pay our own bills and find ourselves a place to live, survive on our own, not needing anyone else to help us, things like that. In Buddhism, this is a little bit more literal, okay? For instance, human beings cannot live without oxygen, for one, okay? We rely on oxygen to live, therefore we are dependent on that oxygen to stay alive. Same goes with food. All right. We cannot survive without being able to eat what we need, drink the water, you know, fluids that we need in order to get our nutrition and survive. All right. <clears throat> and, you know, that, that, that same goes with, like, say, trees. You know, we think of trees as independent because they grow on their own. But the fact of the matter is that tree still relies on the minerals in the ground, the water, the rain that falls from the sky, relies on the sun to grow. So trees aren't independent, truly independent either. See, in this world, everything exists because of something else. Everything exists because of a dependency on something else, whether that dependency is continued or not. Tables. Tables that are made of wood. All right. In order for a table to exist, it relies on the materials that it's made from, right? The wood from the trees, the the glue, the, you know, screws or nails, you know, whatever is used to keep that table together. So that's dependent origination. Um, and then the last point that this article made is how Yoda had taught the importance of staying in the present. Folks, if you've ever attended any of my um, Dharma discussion streams before, if you've ever participated in my guided meditations, you know, I've mentioned staying in the present. Um, 
this in the practice of Zazen, in the practice of meditation, and in the practice outside of meditation, there's a strong, you know, there's a, a, a teaching that is essentially universally taught where, but it's very heavily taught in Zen, um, where suffering is the least and one could be happiest just to remain in the present, not to have your mind linger in the past and not constantly trying to look to the future, but to be in the moment. And that's something that's very much promoted, especially during Zazen, especially during sitting and meditation. Um, and this is something that Yoda tries to teach. <coughs> In fact, he expresses this a little bit when he has a conversation with Luke about training. Luke approaches Yoda to be his teacher. And at first, his response was this. He says, ready are you? What do you know of ready? <clears throat> <clears throat> For 800 years, I have trained Jedi. My own counsel, I will keep on who is to be trained. A Jedi must have the deepest commitment, the most serious mind. This one, this one, a long time have I watched. All his life, he has looked away to the future, the horizon. Never is his mind on where he was. Hmm what what he what he was doing and at that point yoda pokes luke with the stick with or with his cane rather hmm. adventure <laughs> excitement <laughs> a jedi craves not these things you are reckless <clears throat> he goes on to quote the buddha and saying the past is already gone the future is not yet here. There's only one moment for you to live, and that is the present moment. He's also quoted as saying, Do not dwell on the past. Do not dream of the future. Concentrate on the mind. Concentrate the mind on the present. The last source I had, I actually got from a popular Buddhist publication called, um, it's called Lion's Roar. Look up that magazine sometime, especially if you want to learn about Buddhism and uh, modern application and some modern stories from teachers that are still alive, that are still teaching very prominent ones like the Dalai Lama, like uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, and all the, you know, all those folks it's very it's a very good publication and the person who wrote that article is named matthew bortolin who got his material from a book he wrote called the dharma of star wars <laughs> so yeah he he wrote a book on all these parallels it's really really interesting and um he makes his points the article was mainly about the last jedi drawing in Buddhist themes more so than some of the previous movies. And it was written around the time where The Last Jedi had come out very recently. So a little more recent than what we would consider recent now, I guess. Um, and so some of the points, a couple of the points that uh, they make, there's actually three points that he makes with regard to um, – Buddhism and specifically the last Jedi. Um, and I had noted that, um, you know, meditative practices depicted, um, and Supreme leader Snoke describes something that also calls to possibly calls to the middle way and, or dependent origination. And when I give you the quote, maybe you'll understand why. Um, but he first talks about the non-dualism in the Force. 
Uh, 800 years, what do they measure years with? Earth standards. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a good point, you know. I mean, we're talking about the galaxy, a galaxy far, far away, where Earth probably doesn't exist in that galaxy. At least I don't think it's based off the galaxy in which Earth is from, um, you know, from which Earth is. So, yeah, by what standard? I, I'd imagine it's whatever standard the planet in which, you know, Yoda resides. I mean, that's, I make that, but I make that assumption in context to where they're at. They probably have their own galactic standard. Yeah, that's, that could be, that could be the galaxy was united several times. So they could be, there could be a standard time scale that's agreed upon um, by the entire empire republic or at the time it would have been empire. Shadows of the Empire, IIRC, saying, you have five standard minutes to comply. Didn't mean it was, <laughs> no, that's okay, that's okay. Um, so the first point they point out is the non-dualism of the force. So in Buddhism, we often discuss non-duality, okay, which is, which essentially teaches that dualistic concepts are constructs of human ego or human persona. Um, they are opinions and not necessarily reflections on what really is or what reality actually is. Okay. So, this is a this this could be hard for people to wrap their brains around because this also tells that in reality there really is no good or bad or benevolence and evil or um you know uh, unless we're talking about absolutes you know correct and incorrect or you know things like this um again there's there's some exceptions to these i mean correct and incorrect i mean if it's an absolute fact that we're talking about then there is going to be a correct and incorrect i mean as buddhists we're also encouraged never to speak in rumors or lies all right um to always hold on to facts and truth um and discuss those so but this is kind of a weird concept for us because we're used to saying well yeah there is there is good and evil there is good and bad right this you know these things are good these things are bad you know but there are some things that but sometimes we have people that think that some things that are bad are actually good and vice versa so, you know, and this comes as like a de determination for things like, you know, popular opinion, um, societal rules, um, societal roles, family roles, um, things like, I mean, this plays, you know, morality, you know, this plays into a lot of stuff, um, and that's not as to say as that Buddhism doesn't have a moral compass or anything because of all this. Because really in Buddhism, it a lot of things boil down to, you know, does it cause suffering? Is it something that is going to be hurtful to oneself or others? Is this action going to result in being hurtful? somehow and it's kind of what it boils down to so and i should probably do a discussion on that at some point because non-duality i mean that discussion could get super involved and 
that's not really the main focus on this particular discussion. Um, but what makes this weird about talking about non-dualism in the Force is that the Force, throughout the entire series, is always expressed in dualism, right? Whenever they're talking about the Force, okay, we're talking, you know, they always discuss, what, the light side and the dark side, the opposites, the duality of the Force itself, right? And I mean, there wasn't even an episode of the Clone Wars where Anakin and Ahsoka and a couple of the other crew, and they end up on this planet that seemed uncharted, that they never, no one's really heard of before. And it turns out being sort of the birthplace of the Force, where this old man is trying to keep peace and balance between his daughter and his son, which were personifications of the light side and the dark side, respectively. So, I mean, they, you know, Lucasfilm went as far as to depict precisely the originations of the dualism that's within the Force, right? And if I do recall on that episode, you know, the dark side nearly won outright and almost got very, very dangerous until Anakin had to come back and kind of fix it. But anyway, <coughs> so I was thrown by this when Matthew said, hey, they are showing non-dualism in the Force. I'm thinking, well, okay, so how is that? And this is where he quotes, this is where he discusses Luke instructing Ray to meditate. And Luke says to her, just breathe. And then asks, what do you see? And Ray expresses that she sees light, dark, life emerging and dying, the cycle of death and birth. Luke called this balance, okay? Like complementing dark. <clears throat> it's not the violent tension between good and evil, but complementary opposites. He says, nothing is separate or excluded. It's a single existence unified by the force. He says, this comes much closer to the Buddhist notion of non-dualism. Not, not one, not two. As it would be said. This is also where Supreme Leader Snoke weighs in on it. He had a more dualistic view of it. He said, the darkness rises and the light to meet it. So Snoke may have been thinking dualistically, but he touches on truth. You can't have one without the other. There is no light without darkness. No nirvana without samsara. No insight without suffering. I personally struggle with this a little bit. I mean, this is why I think this points more toward dependent origination in the middle way rather than the non-dualism of the force specifically. Only because he talks about two things trying to balance, you know, he talks about these two things being balanced, okay? He talks about, oh, hey! My Panda Dream, thank you so much for the raid. Yokoso, welcome. Appreciate you guys coming in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's see if... Let's see if my shout out command will work today. Yay! How was your stream? Uh, how was your stream? How was how was your crafting going? <laughs> Probably. <yeah. laughs> well, I'm glad she thought of it on her own. 
I'm glad she thought of me on her own and she thought to uh, share her community with uh, with uh, me here tonight. So thank you and welcome Raiders. Um, welcome to the channel. Let me give a brief introduction before we continue. Um, I'm Tizen. Um, I run uh, Tizen.org, which you can see in the upper left-hand corner of which this channel is a part. And gaming-wise, we do a lot of Nintendo content, a lot of Nintendo Switch content, as well as a lot of retro gaming. Um, we also do we also do discussion um, of numerous things and and Buddhism. So, and in fact, that's that's what we do normally Sunday nights before we get to our game. And tonight we're actually doing uh, parallels of Buddhism with something very popular, Star Wars. And, um, you know, we're getting toward the end of that, of um, my portion of the discussion where I just kind of talk and, you know, let the information go. And then we start the game as I let that all information marinate in the chat. So. <laughs> Is going apart as a loving husband helping his wife out. Yep. Yeah, and I do encourage you guys to go check to go check her out. Cause you know, she's very she's very talented at what she did uh does. Um she created oh I can't believe the name of the doll eludes me because it's from one of my favorite series, Bob's Burgers. Yes, the Coochie Kopi. Thank you. And she did an excellent job with it. And she did a very good job, especially for someone starting out streaming, you know, communicating with. She completed it tonight. Awesome. Awesome. She did a very good job. I liked what I saw. <laughs> so. And, uh, you know, from what I saw, she did a very good job, you know, trying to concentrate on her craft while trying to communicate with chat. Um, truth be told, I did test her out a little bit getting into that big Bob's Burgers discussion with her. But it was a fun discussion. That's the main reason why I did it. And then I thought to myself, you know, I kind of put her through the grinder in chat trying to <laughs> see, see how well she can juggle those tasks. So... Omega Shaggy, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate it. Welcome to the online sangha, my friend. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of this discussion and the game that we will be playing in just a little bit, which is going to be, we're going to actually finish up the demo for Balan Wonderland. That's going to be pretty exciting. It's a very fun game. I might try and find a way to buy the game hopefully <laughs> anyway um so we had just finished discussing how we identified the non-dualism in the force and it's just it was weird to me it was kind of weird to me to see that especially with what you know snoke had said about it because in thinking about it, if a Buddhist philosophy, you know, teaches that, you know, non-dualism is, you know, opinion based. And so in removing ourselves from our ego selves and removing, you know, eventually, you know, separating ourselves from that dualism. What are we trying to balance then? What are we trying to compare? Because if we're outside of our own ego space and outside of our own opinions and actually viewing reality for what it is where there is no dualism then there's nothing to balance there's nothing that's there which would be a relief for the mind i guess that's why they call it liberation right um <laughs> but yeah like that's that's still giving me some thought that's still stewing around in my head and now it gets to stew in yours. Yay. Um, I also talked about some parallels to karma. All right. For those of you who don't know what karma is, and 
I'm guessing many of you think you know what karma is. It's, it's a, um, so what karma is, it's a poly word. It more directly translates to just action in the phrase, pay it forward. <laughs> um, that's all karma is, is action. Cause and effect plays into karma. Okay. You've probably all heard, you probably heard the more westernized definition of karma where, you know, things that you do come back to you, right? Or as they would say in the television show, My Name is Earl, you know, do good things and good things will happen to you. Do bad things and bad things will happen to you. Unfortunately, this is not an accurate understanding of what karma really is. Um, it's really more simple and yet more complex at the same time. And yeah, the what goes around comes around. I mean, that's not so much. See, the reason that's inaccurate is because karma isn't this like cosmic force of justice. You know, it's not this, you know, floating, separate floating entity of petty that, you know, people seem to think it is. You know, it's, you know, it it's. It's simply cause and effect. You know, any action that you do affects something, whether it's yourself, whether it's something nearby, you know, whatever. But anyhow, they describe a couple of depictions of this, um, particularly having to do with the newer characters. Um, one of them being um, in Ray's case. When Ray enters that cave, there's a cave that was heavy with dark side, right? And how she was seeing all of her actions displayed before her and some of their effects and how all those actions eventually came back to her. Another instance in that movie had a lot to do with Kylo Ren. If you'd seen the film, then you would know, have noticed that Kylo Ren was very burdened by some of his past actions. That eventually got him to, you know, being a Sith, okay? But, you know, it's still, you know, some of his actions still weighed heavily on him, particularly when he killed his father. His father, had, you know, I should probably have warned those coming in. There's probably going to be some spoilers, so if you haven't seen the movies... You know, I apologize. Unfortunately, it can't be avoided in the discussion. So, um, well, yeah, particularly who haven't seen the modern Star Wars, but any of the material that I touched on, um, mainly the material I touched on had to do with the movies more so than like the TV series. So, so yeah. Um, but yeah. But yeah, Kylo Ren at one point murdered his father, Han Solo, and uh, that weighed heavily on him, and it actually started to affect some of his actions. Um, one of those being that he couldn't fire on his mother's ship. Luke, you know, during his confrontation with Luke, Luke says to Kylo Ren, he says to him, if you strike me down in anger, I will always be with you, just like your father. which I think is actually a pretty good depiction of one thing, one effect of karma, you know? Some people, some people define that as um, your conscious nagging you for something that you did in the past. I've only seen The Force Awakens, nothing else. I'll tell you what, if you've got, you know, if you've got Disney Plus, you can see it all. They've got basically all of Star Wars on that streaming service, like all of it, except the old holiday special. I don't think I saw the old holiday special on there. And you know what? That's just fine. <laughs> um, the last concept, the last Buddhist concept that Matthew points out has to do with a phrase called a painting of rice. A painting of a rice cake does not satisfy hunger. And here's where he makes that parallel. At one point in The Last Jedi, 
Luke tried to destroy the sacred Jedi texts because he felt that the Jedi had succumbed to hubris. Now, his plans were thwarted between Yoda and Rey, so they never got destroyed, but it quelled his grandeur. <clears throat> but there's a Zen saying that says, a painting of a rice cake cannot satisfy hunger. And this is meant to mean, this is meant to warn students that you know, holding too much reverence in things like sacred texts and teachings could act as a distraction from being in the moment. So while sacred texts do have an importance, they have a function, and, you know, they are to a degree necessary. You know, they're not, they're not, they're not things that you want to hold, you know, too tightly to. Um... I mean, he also goes on to describe sacred text as fingers pointing to the moon. Fingers pointing to the moon. And essentially what that means is, you know, as instruction, I can tell you the moon is by pointing to it. But you're not going to really know that moon, what, you know, that moon is there. Or what it looks like or anything, unless you look to where I'm pointing. I can tell you where the moon is, but you've got to look. You've got to see the moon for yourself. He, he describes, however, that, you know, the painting is a warning. He says it's truth itself. It is a mistake to think that the painting of the rice cake is less real or less important than the edible rice, than the edible cake. To dismiss one is to lose the truth. Personally, I can kind of, personally, I kind of relate that is, you know, sure, that is important. I mean, that painting yields information, right? So, like, if I didn't know what a rice cake was and I saw one, I wouldn't know what it was. I probably wouldn't know what to do with it. But if I saw that painting of the rice cake, and maybe, you know, there's information like some writing on the painting, a caption, like, say, in the form of, like, what's on the painting, and, you know, saying, hey, this is a rice cake, you know, then I'd finally, then I, then I know what one was. So if I saw one for real... I know what it is. I probably know that it's okay to eat it, <laughs> you know. But the point there is that you can't rely on the painting alone to give you the full experience, the full, you know, the full range of information about something or the full experience. Sometimes when you read, when you read something in a book, you don't get the experience. You're taught about it, right? Reading about Disney World is not the same as going to Disney World, <laughs> right? You can sit there and read the brochure and think, oh, that sounds like fun. Or you can go to Disney World, experience what the brochure said, and experience that fun for yourself. And I'm willing to bet that the latter is going to be more fulfilling. And he kind of ends all this by saying everything is sacred. You know, the present moment. The Jedi text, the rice cake, the canvas, the ink, and the brush. So it's unclear whether Luke realizes this, but the movie itself suggests this deeper meaning. Um, in quoting one of the most, in, in quoting the, uh, the monk who brought Buddhism and Zen to Japan, Eihei Dogen himself, he wrote, Life and Death, their coming and goings, and all are all painted pictures painting pictures. Supreme Enlightenment is indeed a painted picture painting a picture. All the Dharma world and the empty sky, there is nothing whatsoever that is not painting a picture. <laughs>